Joe Douglas, airplane builder, shows Edsel Ford and Charles Sorensen of the Ford Company, one of the new attack bombers being built for Uncle Sam. Similar types are seeing action with the RAF and are said to have a top speed of 350 miles an hour. The auto company is going to manufacture parts for these and other planes to be assembled at big Midwest plants. This is Big Defense News. The Duke of Windsor is special guest at the All-American Air Maneuvers. He flew over from the Bahamas to witness the thrilling cavalcade of stunts and stunt flyers headed by Uncle Sam's fighter planes. An old Ford tri-motor nearly steals the show. Harold Johnson is at the controls. Or is he? Hold everything. Here comes Tommy Boyd, alias the Batwing, and he's coming fast in a delayed jump that's hard on the nerves. But he finally opens up, much to the relief of the thousands here, including the Duke of Windsor. He's down the hard way. Nice kind of work, but he can have it. Here comes a motor that has done 450 hours in the air. Time to change it. They do in a hurry, setting a record. Mechanics of a school squadron at Randolph Field, Texas. A procedure that used to take one and sometimes two days. Construction improved, they do it now in 45 minutes, setting a record for quick work, mighty important for the maximum use of military planes. And here's hoping they've reinstalled the motor properly. Seems okay, the motor fixed good and strong. Has to be for that. Final test of the record-breaking motor installation, a snap roll. Doughboy's on a scaffold, but don't worry, it's Uncle Sam's new air infantry in training. That's one way of learning how to handle parachute harness and shroud lines. Lesson number two just gets you into the feel of the thing. Officers are interested spectators as the platform hoppers do their stuff. They're mastering the proper landing technique. Those parachute boys look as if they mean business. If they don't know how now, they soon will. All aboard. Practice jumps start at 3,000 feet. Now they know what the top sergeant means when he yells, fall out, half a mile up. American workers from coast to coast, turning out planes by the increasing thousands to make this nation master of its fate. Scenes like these at the Douglas factory are duplicated in many other plants building more and more planes for Britain and the United States. Floor space doubled, workers almost tripled within a year. Tremendous backlogs. Given time, Uncle Sam will be unbeatable. The making of Allison liquid-cooled motors is one of the most important tasks of the day, and one of the most intricate. Its mass production for national defense at this Indianapolis plant, also most complicated production. The assembly department, and here we witness the vital process of testing a motor. That thing of giant horsepower must be perfect. In a speeding plane, it must give unfailing performance. Soon we'll see a tryout with propeller, a whirl, and a roar. The test is more exacting than flying performance in a plane. Uncle Sam makes a realistic test of the eastern seaboard's vulnerability to air attack. 
At Mitchell Field, bombers act as enemies, and through four days, Paramount News cameramen exclusively film the historic experiment. B-18 bombers take the air for surprise thrust at an 18,000 square mile target of Connecticut, Rhode Island, Massachusetts, and Eastern New York. Make believe enemy bombers raiding U.S. soil. Down below, 10,000 badges mark 10,000 volunteer observers at 700 watching posts. Legionnaires form the Army's network of sky watchers on the alert for the bombers. The enemy, and into the foam, two words, Army Flash. New York switchboard operators ring airports. Map spotters plot locations, and at pursuit plane headquarters, the enemy's course and number are jotted down. Then action. Fighter pilots on the move to intercept the bombers. And any one of 10,000 civilian watchers can start this efficient defense machine. happen if the bombers were real enemies. American fighter craft demonstrate combat tactics. The test over, planes salute New York skyline, but the drill proved vulnerability of eastern cities, proved America must throw thousands of wings to guard her skies. Class in aerial navigation. Flying cadets of the Army are given a course of training in the art of reckoning a position and keeping a straight course while in flight. At Miami, Pan American Airways conducts the class, and expert navigators of the commercial airways instruct the military student pilots in the complexities of instruments and mathematics. There are many new tricks nowadays in the ancient science of navigation, and an Army flyer must know them all, like the use of the octant. into a Skyliner to study the instruments on the actual control board. For example, the subtle device employed to check the compass. The graduates get their diplomas. 1,000 student navigators to be trained. A course of 12 weeks of intense study. Army aviators who certainly will know their way round the sky. Something new for national defense. An improved self-catapulting auto gyro warms up to show military experts what it can do. The unusual whirlwind craft requires no space for a takeoff. It jumps absolutely straight up. Seeing is believing, so here's an encore. The ship takes less than six seconds to attain normal flight. Now being studied are its military possibilities as a flying courier and artillery spotter. Army officials and Congress leaders look over a new Pitcairn autogyro that may prove a valuable weapon in wartime. By supplying power to the rotors, the new gyro acts like a helicopter. Watch. The RAF uses autogyros, which make excellent observation planes, due to their hovering ability and slow speed. And if trouble brews, why, come on down. All you need is somebody's backyard. Aircraft workers are given a surprise party by the Army Air Corps. The men who build flying fortresses are permitted to bring their families to inspect the newest ships. It's part of a nationwide get-together to spur cooperation between the civilian and military arms of national defense. Speeding from Fort Douglas, Utah to Seattle, the 7th Bombardment Group puts on a special demonstration of sky power. As the giant bombers soar above Mount Rainier, they let America know that Uncle Sam's long-range sentinels are on guard. A ground view of American air power. 
families of Boeing aircraft employees get a look at Army bombers. It's a chance to see the very part of the plane the family breadwinner made, a first-hand look at the real thing. Then a flight above the plant and a formation salute by 18 flying fortresses and Douglas bombers to the national defense workers who build our planes. planes in a symphony of flight and beauty before Washington's towering Mount Rainier. As part of a West Coast demonstration for aircraft workers and civilians, six flying fortresses skirt the treacherous slopes of Mount Rainier, almost 15,000 feet up. The 300 mile per hour giants present a striking picture from our United Airlines camera plane and a reassuring sight for peace-loving Americans. Planes like these with their long range and striking power are going to England. These are for Uncle Sam and America's defense. planes for aid to Britain. Martin bombers in quantity production at Middle River, Maryland. As the Lend-Lease bill becomes law, the stream of war supplies that it authorizes begins to flow, aviation equipment especially. These airplane parts need special tempering and get it in a fiery bath. Sodium nitrate bath, 900 degrees hot. The motors are monster producers of horsepower, the mighty energy needed to propel a swift bomber. Ready to fly in the climax of the battle for Britain. Crated for shipment abroad, the air fleet in crates. This plant now being expanded will be the biggest airplane factory in the world. for Britain and Greece begins with speed and drama. Minutes after its final approval, the historic Lend-Lease bill is signed by President Roosevelt. Five minutes later, the President approves the first transfers of war material. 3,000 miles away, King George gives personal welcome to America's new ambassador, John G. Wynan. Britain hails Lend-Lease aid as a Magna Carta of faith. A British harbor sees four more overage American destroyers. Under the new bill, $629 million worth of warships and merchantmen may be provided. America acts with speed. In Washington, our cameramen visualize real rush days for Navy and War Department employees. Fighter plane. In the Curtis Buffalo plant, fast P-40 pursuit planes are made ready for shipment overseas. Two and a half billion dollars worth of American-made planes are ordered under the Lend-Lease Bill. Ready now is vast power for Britain. U.S. cruisers of the Omaha class are reported to be slated for immediate transfer. Flying fortresses for Britain. Some were reported to have taken off only minutes after the president signed the Lend-Lease Bill. Mosquito boats are under construction, useful craft in Britain's fight against Germany's spring war on vital convoys. America acts fast under its new law, defending freedom. A number one base in the air training program. And today military aviation is on parade. March of the Flying Cadets at Randolph Field. General Pershing and former Vice President General Dawes keenly scrutinized the student pilots. 
These lads are the manpower of air power. They fly low, and that takes more skill than high flying. At the Texas flying field, Army aviators give a thrilling demonstration of hair trigger skill. The smallest fraction of air might result in a human catastrophe. Planes plunging into the lines of cadets, but there is no fraction of air. The United States Army reveals for the first time the American type anti-aircraft balloon. The idea is that the balloons, great quantities of them, stand sentinel in the skies around the city they guard. From each balloon are suspended steel cables to entangle enemy aircraft. The American balloon is patterned after the British barrage balloon. The Germans laughed at the idea but quickly changed their minds. American experts believe the balloon barrage is here to stay. time in Georgia and jump time for Uncle Sam's new 501st Parachute Battalion, 70 of them in this mass demonstration. Officers called jump masters in new army lingo make the all-important inspection, for each man's life depends on exactly correct preparation. Equipment planes carry parachute-supported machine guns and heavy equipment, and one equipment ship accompanies each six personnel planes. A lesson learned from Europe's war. Here is the real thing, Norway just a year ago. These are actual pictures of Nazi parachutists in their sky invasion, and these jumpers paved the way for greater parachute feats in Holland and Belgium. Now, over here, 1941 parachute troop drills. Led by the equipment plane, big long-range transports take the air. Heavy equipment first aimed to land on the exact rendezvous point below. Now, out and over. High speed jumping. The American technique calls for split second timing and breathtaking precision. world first heard of parachute troops from American experiments made before the last war. Today, hundreds are being safely trained for our streamlined forces. Right on the pre-selected spot, jumpers find their parachute dropped equipment on hand and ready. Overhead, U.S. pursuit planes are in position to lay smoke screens to hide the flying infantrymen. America's army steps ahead in the new lessons of defense. New system of plane construction, plastic plywood, and the plane is christened at the Bendix Airport in New Jersey with appropriate ceremony. Industrialist Harley Clark takes a ride on the trial flight. It's a training plane for the schooling of military pilots. The plastic plywood construction is designed to avoid defense program bottlenecks encountered in the building of all metal aircraft. This factory is completing its 1,000th plane for the Army. The Stearman Aircraft Company of Wichita, Kansas, is the first to reach the 1,000 mark in the number of war planes delivered to the military forces. The defense program calls for busy construction, and that's what we see here, mass production of planes. Major Harris of the United States Army congratulates company executive J.E. Schaefer and takes delivery of the 1,000th plane. 
employees of the company are enthusiastic. And the takeoff with a cheer. There goes the first 1,000th plane delivered to the Army by any aircraft plant. On the plotting board, the position of enemy bombers is marked as word comes from civilian spotters. A New York demonstration of defense against air raiders. Half a million civilians are being enlisted nationwide. If need be, they'd report like this. Army Flash, three, by motor, scene high, Morgan 10. Flash, three, by motor, scene high, Morgan 10. Army Control Center for Air War Protection. Watching the board, officers note the position of the bombers, and an order is flashed to the defense of that area, to the fighter squadron, and the pilots hurry to the attack having been directed by the latest technique in the strategy of the sky. The bombers are spied by the fighters which dart to the attack. Word is flashed to anti-aircraft batteries which fire a barrage. repair shop of the Army Air Corps at Duncan Field, Texas. Here military planes are brought to be fixed up and reconditioned. Spare parts are stored in huge quantities, a supply for six months. Maintenance is a number one factor in aviation necessary for efficiency in the sky. And with this repair and storage depot, the Army puts emphasis on maintenance. A giant Army B-24 bomber arrives for inspection by 78-year-old Henry Ford. Bodies for the big ships will soon roll off Ford assembly lines. Edsel Ford reveals that a few hundred Ford engineers have been in California getting production details for Father Henry. It's a gala day at the big consolidated plane plant. Canadian Air Marshal Bishop, the world's greatest living world war ace, who downed 72 enemy planes, is here to visit with plant heads and the 16,000 employees now turning out huge bombers for Britain. He's Canada's Air Force recruiting chief at home, but here, he's just one of the boys. They're flying to Mount Shasta, the 55th Pursuit Squadron of the Army Air Corps. Winging at 17,000 feet above the towering highlands of California. It's a maneuver flight with a military purpose, but it's superbly scenic too. There's Mount Shasta, a giant more than 14,000 feet high, towering with snow-clad grandeur in the clear sky of the west. The squadron of fighting planes circles around the spectacular peak, just to make the scenic effect of the flight complete. their way to gunnery practice and you'll see how skillful the sky shooting is. A sleeve target is released and towed near Galveston, Texas, there to swoop down on that. Peeling off. In disciplined maneuver, the planes of the squadron swoop down on the target as it's towed along, a mark for bursts of machine gun fire. Like long-experienced veterans of the Army Air Corps, 
Yet they're Tensaw National Guard aviators in training. They've learned the acrobatic art of air battle, how to shoot down a hostile warplane. Wendell Wilkie is special guest for the dedication of the great new Volte aircraft plant at Nashville, first to be built within the inland defense zone. The huge structure contains 18 acres of floor space and will turn out scout planes for Uncle Sam and dive bombers for Britain. On a 24-hour day, seven-day week schedule, the president's latest request, what a bunch of planes they'll be able to turn out here. They say this tower makes parachute training less frightening than just jumping out of a plane. But we wouldn't know. Just offhand, it doesn't look very soothing. Steel workers are putting the finishing touches on this training device for the parachute battalion at Fort Benning, Georgia. They don't mind, but they're funny that way. You crawl out to the edge. And when you let go, the parachute opens, like this, and lets you down nice and easy, like that. More bombers for Britain. With the President's plea spurring the aviation industry, the Lockheed plant goes all out in production of Hudson bombers for the RAF. Wings the British Lion once and is getting special delivery. While aiding England's airmen, Uncle Sam's not forgetting his own. The Army gets a lightning interceptor. Powered by liquid-cooled motors, the ship can take off in a flash to intercept enemy bombers. A flying arsenal with machine guns and cannon in its nose. The world's fastest warplane. It speeds seven miles a minute. America's speed demon, so fast that ordinary man can't fly it without chemical help. Test pilot Milo Bircham dons an oxygen mask. For 30 minutes, he'll breathe deep and ride a bicycle cramming his system with oxygen to prevent blackouts when flying at 500 miles an hour plus. A special air pressure helmet and a flight oxygen mask. And it's all aboard the P-38 Interceptor, the world's fastest plane. Twin propellers turning in opposite directions, the heavily armed P-38 cruises around 400 opened up well. America sees another new marvel of aviation, the Sikorsky helicopter. The takeoff, 90 degrees straight up. This experimental model, a veteran of hundreds of test flights, goes aloft to attempt to break the world's endurance record for flight over one spot. Vertical flight. Since 400 B.C., man has tried to build helicopters. This American invention came out in the 1920s, did not rise. This windmill plane was another product of a decade ago. Freaks, people called them, laughed at them, and air-minded dreamers went ahead building, scheming and failing. But each time, aviation learned something new, something important. These flapping flops of yesterday each played a part in today's great triumphs of aviation, though more than faith took a shaking. And hovering in a May 1941 sky, Igor Sikorsky and his helicopter proved that vertical flight has arrived. U.S. military observers see important uses for this craft that supported only by its main rotors down draft, notice the blown grass, utilizes three-tailed propellers for control of flight forward, sideways, backwards, or in circles. Sikorsky has at last achieved in a machine the hummingbird's flight, 
the poised suspension in the air of the little bird that started Leonardo da Vinci drawing helicopter plans 500 years ago. One hour and 32 and a half minutes of flight in suspension, a new world's record. Able to land within 18 inches of any given spot, the helicopter may open a vast new field of air tactics to American airmen who won't believe the phrase, there ain't no such bird. Air power in the brilliant skies of California. Flying fortresses of the Army, 22-ton monsters, each of which carries a bomb load of 2,500 pounds. Each is driven by 5,000 horsepower and has a radius of 3,500 miles. Formidable figures expressing power in a glowing sky. The squadron flies over clouds and over towering peaks. The clouds open and we see San Jacinto Mountain. Flying fortresses visit that lofty citadel of the Sierras. One of the Army's deadliest fighter planes, the Curtis P-40, loads up for a ground firing test. When the pilot presses the trigger, six machine guns bark at one. Two 50 caliber guns in the nose, shooting right between the whirling propeller blades. Every burst converges on the mark. The last word in synchronized firing. At Wright Field in Dayton, Ohio, the Army's new portable laboratory puts photo processing on a blitz basis. This observation plane has just taken pictures of enemy concentrations, and over they go. The films float down and are rushed to the lab and into the dark room. In a matter of minutes, prints are ready and start on their way to the division commander. Use of this portable processing equipment means that finished aerial photographs of targets are quickly available to advance headquarters. After five years, the biggest bomber ever built the Douglas B-19 gets set for its trials. With a wingspan equal to the height of a 20-story building and wheels that dwarf the tallest man, this 80-ton giant is capable of flying to mid-Europe and back with 18 tons of bombs, a $2 million sky battleship that makes all other bombers look like toys. New Yorkers get a look at a transport plane that may become one of Uncle Sam's most potent military weapons. The Curtis Wright Transport, largest twin-engine plane in the country, is equipped to carry 36 passengers. But stripped for war service, it could carry 50 armed soldiers 1,500 miles. The Air Corps has 300 giants like these on order a fleet capable of transporting 15,000 troops across the continent overnight. Class in aviation is given theoretical instruction in the art of flying, and eager pupils they are. They go to get their diplomas at the Southwest Airways Thunderbird Field. They're graduates of Arizona's first school for training pilots. This is done under a private contract with the United States Army. Full-fledged birdmen now, ready to do their bit in the service of the sky. After their 2,400-mile trip from the United States, 21 of the Army's flying fortresses line up for inspection at Hickam Field, Hawaii, one of the world's largest air bases. The huge Boeing B-17Ds are of the latest type, fifth of the flying fortress model. Their flight from San Francisco took only 13 hours and 59 minutes. Their presence here points up the importance that Washington attaches to maintaining United States power in the Pacific.
new training equipment at Fort Benning, Georgia. Parachute pupils are drawn to the top of a tower 250 feet high. The first training operation is that kind of descent. They get used to a parachute. Easy way first. The second operation, the pupil is in a position such as in actual jumping, and he gets accustomed to the jerk when a parachute opens. Then practicing how to land, important for a parachute soldier. And finally, they're launched for a descent on their own. Troops from the sky acquire new importance in modern war, and the Army is training them in an up-to-date way. He makes a perfect landing, and now is ready to try it from a plane in the sky. Two tons is the weight of that sky monster at Santa Monica, California. So heavy, the huge wheel crushes the pavement and sinks, and they have to place a big board in to roll it out. The wings span 212 feet. That's the height of a 20-story building. An Army test pilot takes the supergiant out for a trial, though not a trial flight. With a plane that big, the first test is taxiing on the ground, feeling out the controls. The pilot tries the control for lifting, and the front wheel raises. But that's enough. He'll report on the ground test before he actually takes off and makes a test flight in the biggest bomber in the world. Marching with a stride that spots them as British anywhere in the world, these young flyers are part of the first contingent of thousands who will be trained in this country. Things may seem a bit strange to them now, but soon they'll be full-fledged pilots in the American way. And in good American climate, that will mean no wasted hours on the ground. Speed is what counts in this war of wings, and speed it is. going native in a big way. It's a long way from Tipperary, but he's heard about cowboys, from movies perhaps, and say, don't they catch on quick? Wind machines. A mobile battery of them moving into position at Lockport, Illinois. At Aviation School, Army officers are learning the art of gliding, and the wind machines are there to teach them. The blast blows against a tethered glider and raises it, keeps it raised as if in flight. In the artificial storm, the pilot has the same experiences as if he were swinging through the air. He learns the behavior of the glider and how to use the controls, which otherwise he would have to do in actual gliding. Here the lesson is learned in perfect safety. Flying cadets of Uncle Sam's Air Force. From a nationwide network of civilian aviation schools supervised by the Army, they come to Randolph Field. After 10 weeks of primary training, they are ready for the West Point of the Air. The new cadets in hooded link trainers get their first taste of blind flying. Without leaving the ground, they execute banks, spins and difficult air maneuvers. A telltale instrument, plots and rads watch their progress. Then 
out to the line into cockpits for their first use of the airplane as a military instrument. Introduction to formation flying. Randolph Field for the basic course, nearby Kelly Field for advanced students, combined to form the nerve center of America's Air Force training program. Expanding U.S. defense calls for the schooling of 30,000 pilots each year. There's plenty of room for young men, 20 to 26 years of age, with at least high school education, training for a peacetime profession or training to serve their country's defense. Meanwhile, Uncle Sam is building an air force to match any in the world. Company's new million dollar assembly plant at Niagara Falls is one of the first to use a conveyor system inaugurated by the American automobile industry. Six of these ingenious belts, which move along at the rate of an inch every three minutes, will be in operation soon. They will step up production of speedy Aero Cobras for the Army Air Corps. And here's the first Aero Cobra to roll off the new assembly line, all ready to fly and how. First aircraft factory to install a powered mechanized assembly line. The Volte plant, Downey, California. The plane in the making moves from one process to another. The assembly line is the key to the American miracle of the mass production of automobiles. Here we see it applied to aircraft manufacture for national defense. Production in motion. With the new system in operation, this plant now turns out four times as many military planes as it did before, a nation. The test flight of the biggest airplane in the world, to be powerfully armed, gun turret in the tail. At Santa Monica, California, 45,000 spectators watch with tense interest as the Douglas Super Bomber B-19 takes off. Is it possible to raise such a giant? A nerve-tingling moment as she seems to falter, dips. But the immense plane straightens out and soars aloft. That super leviathan of the sky cost three and a half million dollars and took five years to build cruising radius more than 7,000 miles. The landing is a drama. Will it be successful? It takes the utmost of skill to bring to earth a plane of new design and of such magnitude. Wingspan 212 feet. Total weight when fully loaded, 82 tons. And that's being landed for the first time. Wheels down. There's a rebound of the vast weight. And then, smoothly along, the successful test flight of the biggest of all sky craft, latest and largest addition to American air power. Takes quite an aviator for that great a job. Major Stanley Umstead, the U.S. Army's chief test pilot. America's version of the barrage balloon is tested by using them in the Panama Canal, Hawaii, Vital Harbor, and industrial areas. The War Department estimates it needs 6,000. Present appropriations would pay for half that number. Overseas, Warring Britain uses barrage balloons to keep enemy bombers at high altitudes. Just how effective they've been is a very secret. But American experts believe the barrage balloon with its dragnet of steel cables is practical as an anti-aircraft screen. 
The United States units will be highly mobile for rapid shifting from one danger spot to another. Another record for American aviation. Test pilot Bob Fossell is going aloft in a Curtis P-40 standard army pursuit ship for a crack at the speed record. And brother, he does, and how. Last year, an army plane hit 620 miles an hour in a vertical power dive. Fossell exceeds that by over 40 miles an hour. 661 miles per hour. Tribute to Yankee engineering and production. Best in the world. And to test pilot Bob Fossell. Army Air Chief at the National Glider Meet. Major General Arnold considers unpowered planes essential to modern air war. He's getting first-hand data by going up himself. The winch that supplies the takeoff. All phases of soaring are under observation as the Army is buying motorless craft for experimental purposes. Looping the loop without benefit of power. Stunting a glider demands complete knowledge of flight technique. The glider takes its place in the Army Air Corps. The general himself at the controls for a perfect landing. An aerial salute for Argentina's Independence Day. A good neighbor visit from a United States Flying Fortress, carrying a special representative of President Roosevelt, Major General Frank Andrews. The Argentine Republic celebrates not only its national birthday, but also 125 years of statehood. And in tribute to the American official guests, the helmeted Guard of Honor marches. Argentina's Navy marks the holiday also. Volunteers and draftees are reviewed by Vice President Castillo, acting in place of the bedridden President Ortiz. These new sailors bring Argentina's naval strength up to 12,000 men to man the 43 ships of the defense fleet. There's a solemn oath. Impressive not only in Buenos Aires, but impressive also to 20 other good neighbor American republics. Air power. Maxwell Field, one of the Army's training centers, has graduation day for 283 new pilot officers. After 30 weeks, the men of class 41E get an air salute. 1,214 have graduated at this one center in less than a year. So today, it's congratulations to men with wings. First gunnery practice by a squadron of the latest and swiftest of fighting planes. They're heavily armed with machine guns and also with cannon. So load the aerial heavy artillery for practice at Camp Skeel at Oscoda, Michigan. And the planes are Aero Cobras. They go fast and they've got terrific firepower. Army flyers have their first test of marksmanship in this kind of super speedy fighter. There's the muzzle of the cannon in the nose of the plane. How will the aim be going so fast? They dart in the tactics of acrobatic air battle. And now comes the test of sharpshooting at tremendous speed swooping down at the target on the ground.
Going as fast as a bullet, they shoot the bullets. Open house for 20,000 workers and their families. That's how the Boeing Company celebrates its 25th anniversary. A chance for husbands and sweethearts to show the gals what they have been doing for national defense. It's a happy birthday for all us Americans. Major General Patton signs up for spare time work. He commands the 2nd Armored Division at Fort Benning, Georgia. Now, he and 66 other officers and men are studying flying at their own expense at a private school in Columbus. Other students in this voluntary military class range from colonels all the way down to privates. But once that door shuts and they roll off the line, they're all equals here. The freelance flyers have organized the Silver Wings Club. And for the past six months, they've been digging deep to fly high. Instructors claim they're just as tough with officers as men. Anyhow, the planes can tell the difference. The last flight, and graduates line up for their diplomas. Amateur army flyers who invest their own pay to learn how. Payday for Yanks in the Royal Canadian Air Force. But it's just part of the game for these American lads who have pledged their lives in the fight for democracy. Whitey Dahl, veteran of the war in Spain, is an instructor. All in all, there are about 2,000 Americans now in training here. Britain's fight is theirs, too, and how they can fly. They've produced 2,000 fighters to date and they're dedicating a new plant to bring production up to 500 planes a month. There's the 2,000th plane of the Curtis P-40 type, rolling her out with ceremony. OPM Director Knudsen, Assistant Secretary of War Patterson, and other officials inspect the 2,000th plane. Okay, says Knudsen of the OPM, and then a flight by a squadron of fighters. on a scout flight over the mountains. New Zealand military pilots in training. If they should have to parachute down, it would be in a maze of towering peaks and glaciers because they're taking off to soar over the Alps of New Zealand. This flight of the Sky Squadron of the Southern Hemisphere is a reminder of the kind of country New Zealand is with its rivers of mountain ice. Difficult terrain for an invasion, especially since it has a crack air force to protect it. Glacier land under the Southern Cross, to which they give the name the New Zealand Alps. The class of British flyers training in the United States completes its primary training and receives diplomas from Governor Holland of Florida. 75 in all, they go from the Lakeland School here to Alabama, where they'll begin a 10 weeks basic course under Air Corps supervision. And Uncle Sam will keep them flying. Follow that pigskin the Paramount Newsway. Football stars in the nation's armed forces. Yes, every branch has them, and next to Uncle Sam, they like football best. At California's Moffett Field, Lieutenant Raymond T. Morse, All-America end at Oregon. Butch, they called him. He's played for the Detroit Lions, along with Tony Calvelli, Stanford's All-Coast Center. Today, with other pigskin-minded airmen, they're in football gear again, climbing the hangar steps for a new training twist. The idea is that Moffett Field has organized its own team with a couple hundred ex-collegians to draw on. They're training hard for an eight-game schedule. And are they tough? Look at this. Muscle power versus air power. 
fighting the stiff propeller wind, the Army setting the style for football training. There are stunts to dazzle the eye at the National Air Olympics, Dayton, Ohio. We begin with a smoking barrel roll. That wing-over-wing wing kind of thriller is only an appetizer, but they do it with vim, vigor, and abandon. <laughs> Trying to land the plane on top of an automobile. That's the daredevil novelty of the air show. He fails the first time. This time it looks as if he might have trouble doing that perilous task. The platform on top of the auto has slots for the plane's wheels to go into, so watch. And he can also take off again from that strangest of landing fields. Out here in the Philippines, the Army keeps them flying all right. I found mechanics and pilots sleeping in hangars, for our forces are doing a clock round defense alert job. Planes are parked around the edges of airfields, a lesson we've learned from France, where planes lined up on parade rows made two easy targets. Negrito tribesmen look at the strange birds, but stranger things I found at Clark Field Barracks, an order against boredom for the personnel of this remote outpost. Beards are made compulsory, and weekly whiskers inspection provides a laugh and good morale for all hands. Prizes for length and fanciness just don't help some youngsters. To see the island country, I went along on a routine patrol flight. Sugarcane patches and plenty of sugar refining plants are in the lowlands, but volcanic mountains rise up every mile or so, dotted with cloud-hung waterfalls. Reclaimed jungle land has rice under cultivation worked by water buffaloes. Primitive but very efficient, the natives told me. Back with the Army, I found General Jonathan Wainwright directing river fording maneuvers of Philippine troops. These bush fighters have their own way of crossing the innumerable streams. Half a pup tent from each man's marching pack, a rifle or bamboo pole, and they have a boat for their ammunition and equipment. Within seven minutes from the order to shed uniforms, the company was across the stream with all equipment dry. The mule train took longer. Some army mules just don't like Navy tactics. Heavy equipment goes on rafts made of lashed bamboo poles. There's plenty of bamboo everywhere. These Philippine troops, 200,000 of them, are part of our U.S. force now, are naturals at camouflage. In fact, they're quick in every branch of soldiering. Most amazing to me was their proficiency in dispersing when army attack bombers gave them a strafing drill. They take cover well and put up rifle crossfire that strafing pilots say would be deadly. The Philippines look ready on land and in the air. Texas Bells on the biggest blind date on record. They're paired off with young flyers from Brooksfield for a day of fun and frolic. No, you can't pick your date out. It's all done by lot, and they have a lot of fun. Father Francis McCarthy, Brooksfield chaplain, thought up the mass date idea. It gives the flyers a chance to do a few stunts on the ground for a change. 
Say, flying's tame compared to this. You've got to be good to earn your stripes in this business. The old army mule hasn't changed a bit. Boy meets girl, and look what happens. Mmm, it's either chivalry or these cadets just can't keep away from the women. You can't hurt a fella's feelings this way. Boy, give a guy enough rope and he'll get himself a gal. Chief of the Army Air Corps Ferry Command, Colonel Robert Olds, whose exploits as a number one Army Airman have made flying history. He gives orders to his pilots, and they're off on a mission. Their task is to pilot aid to Britain bombers to Canada, where the planes are taken over by the British to be flown across the Atlantic to Britain. So here at Detroit, the ferrying operation begins. American angle, and then the British phase of the bomber ferry service, so important in the European War of the Sky. There's careful planning, charting of wind and weather. This is one of the most adventurous aspects of war aviation, the stream of American-built bombers across the ocean. Four motor giant of longest range and two motor jobs. across 2,000 miles of water, destination England, there to play a part in Britain's increasingly powerful campaign of the sky. Test flight at Seattle of a new type of flying fortress, more streamlined, more powerful. Test flight a success. more cruiser for the world's mightiest fleet, the Atlanta. Christening honors go to author Margaret Mitchell, who wrote a book about Atlanta. A brief pause for workmen in this shipyard that the Navy took over, for there are more ships to be built. This is the Navy's 250th launching since January. 92 more warships are on the building waves. The two ocean Navy is getting there fast. The 251st launching at Quincy, Massachusetts, the cruiser San Juan, sister ship of the Atlanta, goes down to the sea, ahead of schedule and nearly 85% complete. These new cruisers have destroyer speed, will do better than 42 land miles an hour. Many new secrets of design are in these slim cruisers as America meets the needs of modern naval warfare. Ships. First time in the air, the world's mightiest bomber, B-17, newest air fighter for the U.S. Army and the RAF, is filmed from a United airliner. Specifications, range and speed are military secrets, but bad news for Hitler. B-17 rides the sky lanes like a veteran. Another kind of tank for defense. Helium tanks for anti-aircraft bags at the Coast Artillery's first balloon barrage school. 27,000 cubic feet for each bag. It's examination day for the first 3,000 men in the balloon barrage corps. Up she goes. Tactics learned from the Blitz of Britain. Soon every major U.S. area will have such protection, ready for come what may. Zero hour in Louisiana, the greatest field exercise in American military history, with over 40,000 motorized vehicles and half a million men. Dive bombers over the crossroads town of Castor support the 1st Armored Division's advance against 37 and 75 millimeter guns. A demonstration of tank destroyer battalions in action against the spearhead of invading 2nd Army forces.
2,000 officer referees keep score as the army puts the accent on tank warfare and anti-tank defense. Chief of Staff General Marshall arrives in the South to oversee the great war games. An armored division in action, the advance of the tanks. Crossing a stream under artillery fire. Bombers attack the battery of guns. Tanks run into stiff opposition and turn around, trying to escape. They are in trouble. And in a swift maneuver of armored warfare, they are being trapped by the swarming of enemy tanks. They are intercepted, hemmed in. There is no escape. And they are forced to surrender. A smoke screen provides cover for an infantry attack. This is combined with a swift mechanized attack. But the tanks run into cannon fire. Uncle Sam's newest dive bombers on the aerial front in the Louisiana War Games. Pilots and planes on trial in the most realistic defense tests this country has ever seen. Dive bombing mechanized forces of the invading army. bridge across the Sabine River. The invading Red Army moves to attack the Blues. Jeep scout cars are floated over and the armored spearhead thrusts forward under cover of the woods. At the front defense lines, anti-tank guns open up and the Battle of Louisiana is on. cover the defending infantry as they go to meet the enemy. All branches of the service are put to the test as the army applies blitz defense against blitz attack. U.S. and foreign observers vote American planes more than a match for any lightning war tactics. Blitz games for Uncle Sam's first army. Some 400,000 troops transform 10,000 square miles of the Carolinas into a proving ground for men and machines. Anti-tank and anti-aircraft battalions blast into action. Their first test in big scale operation. Motorcycles and combat cars, the advance guard in lightning war, going forward to locate enemy columns. Armored cars clash under realistic blitz conditions in the Battle of the Carolinas. Yes, sir, that's good old-fashioned horse cavalry. Some experts say they'll go where tanks and mechanized units camp. Assault boats crossing the Wattery River. Their mission is to secure a bridgehead for engineers to pave the way for the advance. Pioneers spanning the river with a pontoon bridge. The first army command is concentrating on teamwork among all its units. Simulated dive bombing, nearest thing to the real business without anyone getting hurt. It'll be like this for two months, pile by pile for the first army. over New York as the eastern seaboard from Boston to Cape Hatteras gets a full week of make-believe attacks. 
spotters atop the Empire State Building telephone information centers. Altogether, 40,000 civilian volunteers man 1,800 observation posts in 10 states. In New York parks, playgrounds, airports, and even at racetracks, camouflaged anti-aircraft guns are uncovered and manned in this most realistic of defense drills. River bridges have sky guns, and Easterners give thanks that over here, these are only mock raids. Back to the alarm, flash messages from spotters have also gone to Army nerve centers, and orders are phoned to Army flying fields. Interceptor plane pilots race to their planes ready for sky combat. Down below is Fort Tilden, scene of a second part of the wide-scale defense tests. This fort is to be raided by a so-called Black Army, made up of regular Army units. At midnight, the invasion begins. Invasion boats of all kinds bring 1,500 to the surprise raid. Like creatures of a nightmare, they go into a nightmare of cold, a fantastic re At the Douglas plant, Santa Monica, California, a testing laboratory to see how man and mechanism perform in the abysmally low temperatures of extreme altitudes. How do the men react in their antifreeze suits? And how do those airplane controls behave? There's a vigilant watch to see that nothing goes wrong with the experimenters. In the war, bombers are flying at constantly higher altitudes, approaching the stratosphere. Here, the test is under conditions of 35,000 feet, and the temperature in there goes as low as 104 degrees below zero. The single delivery of 123 training planes at the Old Teeth Plant, Downey, California, ready for delivery. Trainers for the schooling of military pilots are an immensely important factor in the development of air power. And these are all on their way to Army and Navy training fields throughout the country. The great new Douglas Blackout Airplane Factory is dedicated. The 200-acre plant is America's newest and most modern and gets a salute from the mammoth B-19, biggest bomber in the world. Thirty thousand workers will be employed in the huge plant, turning out attack bombers and four-motored flying fortresses. Loaded with scientific equipment, and at Chicago, Arthur Starnes prepares to break the record for a delayed parachute jump. A ponderous helmet for oxygen breathing in the rarefied atmosphere and intense cold of the substratosphere. His reactions are to be measured by the instruments. A false face, but it gets a wifely kiss. And looking like a man from Mars, he goes on a scientific experiment that's daring adventure. He's to jump from the plane six miles high and not open his parachute for more than five miles, dropping like a stone. There. And only at 1,500 does he open his parachute. He lands from an army experiment to tell what would happen to military aviators forced to bail out at high altitudes in air battle. And now his wife thinks he deserves a kiss without the false face. Starnes, who has fallen farther than any other human being, greeted by his wife and son. Full-fledged pilots of the Royal Air Force, first American trained cadets to win their wings here in Southern California. Graduation exercises for the pride of Britain. After 20 weeks of schooling at War Eagle Field, built exclusively for training of RAF fighting flyers, the first 50 received the covet insignia, and there'll be hundreds more. 
instructors wishing them happy landings as they hop off on the first leg of their trip to the battlefront. Final flying tests for the world's biggest and most powerful bomber, the United States Army's B-19. The Sky King staggers the imagination. The rudder tip is four stories above ground. The landing wheels are eight feet across and weigh over a ton apiece. To each wingtip is a half a block's walk. The Army crew goes aboard for the vital test flight. Lieutenant Colonel Umstead, only man to fly the big ship, is next to the last aboard. Then four 18-cylinder motors start their roar of power. Inside the control cabin, the order is, up she goes. A perfect takeoff and the big 2,300-pound wheels fold gracefully into the fuselage. Inside the B-19, pilot Umstead is at the wheel. Everything is calm and casual, or does that cigar indicate a little nervousness? Well, with 8,000 horsepower and a crew of 10 under your command, you might be nervous too, mister. Gun turrets are all over the B-19. In all, there are 18 emergency exits for the crew. Now, let's look inside a wing. Man-sized passageways run through the wings to the motor repair stations. The motors are air-cooled. Each generates over 2,000 horsepower. Each wing also is designed to carry six bombs. Now, the bombardier's turret. Below is Los Angeles, looking like not too difficult a target. No bombs are aboard, but loaded, the B-19 could fly 18 tons of explosives from Brazil to Dakar and back, twice without refueling. The B-19 probably will have no military use. Dreamed up in 1930, working plans required six years. Three quarters of a million man-hours of labor put the big ship together. Serving as a flight laboratory, the B-19 may lead to mass production of new super planes the like of which Berlin and Tokyo have never dreamed. Now, gracefully down, a sleek symbol of America's ability to master the air, a symbol of America's strength when these eagles of freedom fill the sky. latest diesel-powered bulldozers level a sandy rolling field at Marston Strip, North Carolina. Then quickly, lengths of perforated steel are laid in place, and presto, they're building an airfield big enough, it's reported, to accommodate even the mammoth B-19. The holes in the metal strips allow the grass to grow through and camouflage the runway. Efficient, modern, it's the Army's way of keeping pace with the stepped-up air program. An air squadron filmed from our photographic plane. One of our movie cameras is stationed to shoot pictures right through a window in the side. And it makes quite a picture. Air photography is like a dazzling vision here, as why wouldn't it be? With the Army's P-40 fighting planes doing acrobatics in the trade wind far above Hawaii. Spectacular stunting in skies that are themselves so spectacular. They say these latitudes of the South Sea are paradise for the romantic wanderer. Well, for a cameraman with an eye for cloud effects, these latitudes of the South Sea heavens are paradise indeed. Corps cadets are sworn in at ceremony at Detroit City Hall, and those funny guys from Hollywood are on hand. Bud and Lou Costello are in town for the premiere of their newest and screwiest picture.
The auto capital turns out for the fun. Thousands get a glimpse of the celebrities, screen stars, army troops, and high Air Corps officials. Everybody's busy, and that goes for the cops, too. Dick Foran obliges. Bon and Lou escort pretty Carol Bruce. So come on, folks, don't shove. Just keep them flying. Physical training for parachute troops. They get in shape for the dizzy leap sky. In camp at Fort Benning, Georgia, the 503rd Battalion of Paratroops tries out a new type of gigantic apparatus called the Trinasium, a novel contraption providing the nimblest kind of athletics to develop muscular power and flexible agility. Parachute soldiers who jump from planes and float down to earth need a maximum of nimble strength. Jumping exercise is necessary preparation for the parachute leap of the soldiers of the sky. Jumping Jack is the name of this exercise. These Army air cadets at Randolph Field, Texas, are not just playing Sunday picnic games. These are coldly calculated drills, part of the order of the day. Increasing their speed of brain reaction and muscular coordination is what Uncle Sam is after. Right now, poor timing means only an unnecessary spill. But if these men see war service, their split-second judgment may save many lives, including their own. Here's an old one as ancient as the pyramids. It's not spectacular, and it's no engineering feat, but it does build up muscle. The idea is to prove they can take it. West Coast Ferry Command of the United States Army Air Corps. Fighting planes for the RAF with newly commissioned American flight officers at the controls for the first leg of the Southern Mile Hop to Britain. Special training for a hand-picked group of Yankee pilots. This ferry service, taken over by the government five months ago, already has started nearly a thousand planes on their way. Uncle Sam's Air Force does its share to keep them flying for the RAF. the first Army pilot, and now he retires, Major General Frank P. Long. Military ceremony at Randolph Field, Texas, in honor of the Army's number one veteran of the sky. He was taught to fly by the Wright brothers when aviation was beginning, and made the first military solo flight in 1909. He was also the first Army balloon pilot. In 1917, he organized the Air Force of the AES. Now, having reached the age limit, he retires. Aerial invasion in the Battle of the Carolinas. Uncle Sam's sky troopers bailing out at 1,200 feet. A problem in tactics for the Army's newest branch, capturing an enemy airport in what the experts call vertical assault. Any landing's okay if you can still run for that airport. The job's to hold it until your own troop transports move in. Every action is on the double. They hardly wait for the plane to stop. Speed and surprise are the keynotes. Field guns, too, transported by air. Well, whoever invented this blitz business, leave it to the Yanks to perfect it.
This new giant aviation plant is completing its first warplane. At Columbus, Ohio, the Curtis Wright factory is the nation's largest for the building of dive bombers for the Navy. The national war program for the defeat of Japan calls for an immense increase of production for air power. This plant was built recently at a cost of $14 million and now turns out its first Navy dive bomber, the beginning of mass production. This mystery plane has long been rumored in the world of aviation. Now it is revealed in public flight. The Northrop flying wing soaring over the Mojave Desert in California. It has no fuselage. All is contained in the wing, and it has no tail. It peels off with swift agility and looks like a bat. 87 flying cadets received commissions as second Louis in the Army Air Forces. Handpicked from various training centers throughout the country, they've completed instruction in pursuit flying here at Mitchell Field. They'll help protect East Coast cities from aerial attack. of Honolulu as the Japanese in their stroke of treachery attack the city. This is the Waikiki residential section, famed for beauty in the paradise of the Pacific. Vandal havoc wrought by the Japanese bombers. At the upper part of the screen, there you can see them. The people are bewildered by the blow without warning. Water main burst by bombs. These pictures give the city aspect of the sudden sky assault. The military phase, the damage at Pearl Harbor, cannot be shown according to the principle of not revealing information that might be useful to the enemy. In assaulting Honolulu, the Japanese machine gun city streets. And we see shrapnel holes and bullet holes, as well as the injury done by bomb fragments. Family automobiles riddled in this stroke of unprovoked terrorism. Flames were extinguished by prompt firefighting, despite the startling surprise. And among the buildings wrecked was this school. Refugees bearing their misfortune with courage. There was no panic. The people took the bombing bravely and coolly. The Japanese suicide submarine carrying torpedoes on a charge of high explosive which could be blown up against the side of a ship. The boat itself, like a torpedo. Operated by two men, the midget sub entered the wrong channel, ran aground, and was captured. Hawaii recovers quickly from the surprise of the sneak punch and carries on as America's key stronghold in the battle of the Pacific. Hawaii is merely angry and wants to get even. Twenty-seven Canadian boys who call themselves members of the kindergarten of the Royal Canadian Air Force visit Mitchell Field. Fifteen to eighteen years old, the air cadets are training for future flying service at home, where 14,000 others like them are working for the day when they can earn their wings. Future aces, all of them. Depth charges and the steel prow of an American destroyer wrecked this Jap two-man sub in Pearl Harbor during the treacherous attack on December 7th. The San Jose football team on tour here has volunteered for police duty and comes out of a huddle with a real catch. All Hawaii is anxious for another crack at the Japs. These flyers shot down the first Jap planes, Lieutenants Lewis Saunders and Philip Rasmussen. Kenneth Taylor and George Welch, who accounted for six planes between them. Lieutenant Harry Brown, another of Uncle Sam's present-day heroes. This group got nine Jap planes. Not bad. Mm -hmm. 